city of Jaffa, or Jaffa as it's written in the Berith Chadashah, the Christian Bible. It is a city of 4,000 years of history, from the Egyptians, the Canaanites, the Israelites, even the city where it is written in the Christian Bible that Peter resided here with one Simon the Tanner at the seaside. It is where Peter saw the vision of the sheet that is let down with all manner of unclean beast in it, and God says to him, kill and eat. He says, not so, Lord, for nothing unclean has ever come into my mouth. Kind of fascinating to even think about that when you consider that he was still keeping kosher, even after Yeshua had already come and gone. So all kinds of things we could say about here, but one thing in particular that really brings my mind here, seems we're in Israel and we're not in Egypt, is that there's actually Egyptian artifacts right here on this mount. Right here, it's a little tiny mountainside here, right here on the edge of the sea, or maybe not so much a mountain, but a very large hill that comes down to the sea, whereas Tel Aviv in the background there to my left is actually the, the city just comes down to the sea more of a, in, in a flat type of uh, area there. But this place here was lifted up pretty high off the ground, like a giant rock, you might say. But as I think back about the Egyptian times, it reminds me of the story of Joseph. It reminds me of Israel going into captivity. It reminds me, especially seeing the fact that Peter was here. And we know that with Peter, this is where the gospel first began to change hands from Jew to Gentile. Now, later Paul actually does that. Paul takes the gospel of Yeshua from the Jews to the Gentile, and there's an official change that we see that takes place in his own ministry. But it was here that Peter, where that first began. And yet we have the artifacts from Egypt as well, from the time of Ramesses II, according to archaeological finds that were discovered here. But what's fascinating to me is when we think about the story of Joseph, we know, as many scholars have taught, it's an incredible look, Joseph's life is, is a credible look into the life of Yeshua when he came. His whole life types out Yeshua. And this is what we're trying to look at. This is the, the facts that we're wanting to examine is throughout the biblical stories, that we see from, from the Torah, from the teachings there of the fathers, we see a beautiful type of Yahshua. We find it in David, we find it in Joseph. You find Israel typed as well in the life of Saul, in the life of, of Solomon, in the life of Joseph's brothers. And in this segment, I'd like to talk to you about Joseph's brothers. But we find that Joseph's brothers, what do they do? They were very envious of Joseph because he was a dreamer. He saw visions, he had dreams, and his parents always kept them in mind. And what's kind of ironic is the ones that we do see that are recorded anyway, we never see them actually come to pass until later in his life, after he is sold out and then comes into power. Which is kind of interesting in itself, because if you think about it, it's the same with Yahshua. When Yeshua came, he even prophesied. Now, there are rabbinical scholars that disagree with that, but he does prophesy. He even prophesies that there would not be one stone left upon another as far as the temple. He never said the temple mount would be thrown down, but he said the temple would be thrown down. He also prophesied the return of Israel to their homeland. Where he said, your house is left to you desolate until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now, that's a twofold purpose in that mystery right there, in case you're not aware of that. One, the house represents the human heart. In other words, Israel would not receive the Holy Ghost as a whole. And it also represents the temple where the Shekinah glory dwelt. And by the way, the temple, as we know, represents the human body. We are that temple. We are the temple where God, the Holy, the Shekinah can dwell in you today. This is what God's real intention was all along. This is what Adam and Eve were. Adam and Eve were the temple of God in their day. Because we find that in the story of Adam and Eve, God took a Nishmat Chaim, he had breathed the breath of life, his own life, God's own life, in a plural form in that very body called Adam. 
And we know Adam's name comes from Adama, from the ground. Now, actually, his name is really not called Adam. Adam really stands for mankind, if you think about it, because Adam is not called Adam, he's called Ish. And Ish is from the compounded word fire, Ish, Aleph, Sheen, and the Yod in the middle gives him his name, which the Yod is from the beginning of the divine name of God. And why is that put there? It's because God breathed in him Chaim. The Chaim is the life. It's God's own life in a plural form. And that's kind of obvious because if you think about it, there were two trees in the midst of the garden. Now Eve, when she deals with the serpent, says that God said about the tree of knowledge of good and evil not to look at it, don't touch it, don't do anything. And we know that the rabbinical scholars say, well, she stepped her, overstepped her bounds when she said that God has said because God had not spoke to her. Well, that's not true. We know that's not true because God deals with sin and with the sin that you commit. And nowhere do we find in the Torah that God ever dealt with Eve and said that she had overstepped her bounds in what she said. So undoubtedly, she did have that personal relationship with God, and she spoke to God as well. And God spoke to her. In fact, in the fall, God says to her, Tashuf Techa, which is, you will turn to your husband, and he will rule over you. Well, if she turns to her husband, it's because now she's looking to her husband as a source of strength, and with him no longer having the Spirit of God or the Holy Ghost, then he rules over her because he's bigger than her. It becomes a situation of dominance, and not the way God had intended to begin with. And we know that this is not God's way for man to rule over a woman, and why do we know that? Because he even put us here on free moral agency. God does not rule us with a rod or, or, or some big club and say, you do this or else. He put Adam and Eve here with love. And he gave certain rules. The only difference is, is he told them this will happen if you break that rule. But it was never by force. It was with love. And this is what the Holy Spirit actually does, especially when men and women are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's what it does. It brings love. It brings not by force, but by love. A desire to want to keep God's word. So anyway, we find in this story here, in the case of Adam and Eve, God had taken, and it was a free gift that he gave, the Eitz Chaim, the, from the very tree of life. Remember, the tree of life is called Eitz Chaim. God had breathed in their nostrils, Nishmar Chaim, he had put inside of him his own life in a plural form, showing that Eve, of course, was in there, and so she received of that very life as well. And that was God's life. And so therefore, when God taken Eve from the side of Adam, or literally, even though it says he opened up his side, he put him into a deep sleep, the Hebrew word there is for the word coma that we use today in modern Hebrew. God puts him into that deep sleep, but he doesn't say he takes it necessarily from the rib, but he opens up Basar, the flesh, and the scripture clearly says, Minish, from the fire of God, he taken Isha, and her name also, by the way, is the compound meaning of that very same word, Esh, fire, and the second letter in the divine name, the He, which now you have the Yod and the He together when you bring them together as a couple. So as we get back in the story of, of Joseph, and by the way, you never see any place where God had to breathe into her nostrils, do you? It's another interesting aspect. So we find in the story of Joseph, though, Joseph comes along, and what does Joseph do? He's a spiritual man. But he's not accepted by his brethren. His, even his dreams and his visions are actually for a latter time. They would be fulfilled at a latter date. Much like it was with Yeshua when he was here on the earth, his visions, his insight of what would happen would be fulfilled at a latter date. So our house would be left desolate. And he wasn't talking about just the temple. He was showing because, as Jews, those of us that had rejected him, our heart would be left desolate. But those that believed him would not be desolate. In fact, he said it would be that way until we said, Blessed is he that comes in the name of Hashem. Now that's kind of interesting. Because that's really what happens in the story of Joseph and his brethren. They hated him without a cause. 
But yet, when they were happy and blessed to see that God had raised him up to power, then everything had changed at that point there. Then they were happy to be a part of what God had called him for. Now, many of the aspects of the story of Joseph, and as you well know, and as many uh, people know and scholars know, that in his life, we find, by, by scholars and everything, many of the, the similarities between Yahshua and uh, Joseph as well. And, uh, and rather than repeat what we know that the scholars have already said, I'll kind of go through and highlight some of these, and then we'll look at some of the things that perhaps scholars have not taken a look at. Now, of course, we know that in the story of, of Joseph, or Yosef, as we say in Hebrew, in his life, what happened? First off, we see that his father sends him to check on his brethren to see how they do. That's kind of interesting in itself. But when he goes to see them, as they see him coming afar off, knowing that he's going to come, now that's another insight to think about. Why? Because the coming of Mashiach had already been prophesied. So in this case here, as the rabbis began to study the Torah, we knew that he was coming. In fact, when Yeshua was here on the earth and he had been born in Bethlehem, even Herod began to inquire to find out when was Mashiach supposed to come and where was he going to be coming from? This is one of the reasons why he takes and has all the children killed that he could have killed trying to stop Mashiach from coming because then in that hour, Israel knew, the rabbis knew that Mashiach was coming. And so in this case here, we see that his brothers see Joseph coming from a distance. And they begin to conspire what to do with him when he comes. And much like the evil Herod did when he heard about Yeshua. Now, of course, Herod, not being Jewish, he was a secular side. Just like in the final days of Yeshua, the same with him. It was the secular Romans that actually ended up doing the dirty work and having him crucified. But we see that beautiful little type there that seen from a distance, knowing, in other words, from the prophecies, Mashiach should, should, should soon be there. And of course, it's obvious that Satan is just the one that's making the plans of what to do to try to combat that situation of what's going to happen. But once he does come, his brethren, they turn against him. But the one brother, Reuben, he was, did not want to see the evil befall him. And the very names of the brothers are very interesting in itself. Reuben, his actual name means, in the English language, means behold a son. And so, if you really think about it, when they would say Reuben's name, every time they would disagree with Reuben, they kept saying, behold a son, behold a son. No, Reuben, no, behold a son. And then when, when Reuben, he disappears from the scene for a little bit, and while here we have uh, Joseph comes in on the scene, and while this is happening, they take and they bind him, they throw him in a ditch. Then they're trying to decide what to do with him. And of course, we know all the types in that. Yeshua ended up being bound by the, by the Jewish people at the time. He was delivered into the hands of the Romans. And later, of course, we know they cry out for his blood and said, let him be crucified. They preferred Barabbas the murderer to be released over uh, Yeshua. But as the story goes on, we find out, though, that, that Joseph takes and he sold out to the Ishmaelites, and the Ishmaelites end up selling him out to the Egyptians. And there we find, as we know the story, that he is, uh, Potiphar ends up buying him, and uh, he rises to power even, even, even under slavery. And uh, everything he touches, everything he does is blessed. Of course, the same with Yeshua, the same thing. Everything he touched, every person he prayed for, he laid hands on him. if you walked, you know, you could walk by a shadow and be healed. Of course, we know that was uh, 
even after the resurrection, we hear that testimony there, but it was just the fact that his presence, the woman that said, if I only could touch the hem of his garment, I know I would be made well. So many things that begin to happen, the prosperity, what happened under the, under the hand of Yeshua when he was here, just like it was with Joseph, even though he was down in Egypt. Finally, though, Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him, says that he's trying to, was trying to ravish her, when indeed it was nothing but a lie. Same thing with Yeshua. We find that Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him of trying to ravish her, and then he's thrown into the dungeon. The same thing happens with Yeshua. He's falsely accused, and oddly enough, of course, Israel is a type of a woman because she is the bride of God, but falsely accused. He falsely accuses her own Mashiach, her own Savior. And the same thing with Potiphar's wife, if you think about it. What's really strange about that particular story in itself is she had no idea that there was a famine coming upon the land. And the only one that could save her in her house was Joseph. We don't hear much about her after that actually takes place, but we do know that he goes into prison. He's there with the baker and the butler when they're, when they're accused and thrown into prison as well. This is, I don't know, I think like two years after the fact. And ironically, we see that the baker and the butler, one is hung, hung and the other one is delivered up. The butler is actually delivered back to his status as Joseph even prophesies of that. The same thing that Yeshua does when he's on the cross. He prophesies about the two thieves. One would be with him in paradise. The other would end up going to hell. Now, ironically, the one that goes to paradise, if you think about this, another interesting anomaly in this is the fact that he gets the revelation of who Yeshua is at the last minute, nonetheless, but he gets that revelation of who he is. Joseph, when he prophesied about the cupbearer, which bore, brought the cup of wine before the king, you see, wine is a stimulant. It's like the stimulation of revelation. No wonder why Yeshua used wine at the communion table. Of course, it was customary in this time to actually use real wine. It wasn't grape juice, it was real wine. And the reason being is because it represents the older one gets, the stronger it gets. It's the revelation. Just like the thief on the cross, he got the revelation of who Yeshua was. The butler. It's a perfect type of him. And then we take and we, we move on into the story. We find out that finally, um, and of course, the butler never remembers Joseph, even though he asked him to, to remember him, that God would bring him up out of there. But he doesn't. It takes some time, and Joseph's in prison for quite a while longer. But one day when the Pharaoh ended up suffering some massive dreams, some catastrophic dreams, seemingly in the beginning to be great, when there were great harvest, and then there were bitter eerie harvest and the corn that was withered up and how it ate up and gobbled up all the good years of the harvest. And then we find out the same with the cattle, the, the great fat cattle, and then later the lean cattle. We know the story there and how that goes. And of course the Pharaoh is troubled by this and he brings all the magicians and everyone together trying to find out what does his dream mean. And finally the butler does remember Joseph and that he has the gift of interpretation. And right before the Pharaoh is about ready to kill all of his astrologers and, and mediums and everything else that he has, they bring Joseph out. And Joseph clearly discerns and reveals the very meaning of his dreams. And as Joseph says, it's not because of me, but it's because of God. Another interesting fact, when Joseph said, God alone has that. Isn't it interesting how that Yeshua also bears record of that? He said, it's not me, but it's my Father only do what he shows me. But what I really like about the story of Joseph is when we move down into his story there, we find out once that famine does set in, his brothers are still, it's been, been 
by this time about nine years, maybe longer, maybe more like 11 years or 12 years from the time that Joseph was sold out by his brethren, the seven years of plenty had come, and then the seven years of famine had started, and it was close to two years into the famine before his brethren finally come down to buy corn, to buy grain. And what's so beautiful about this story, if you think about it though first, before we get into the closing of this part of the story, Joseph's brothers, or Joseph in this case here, he's working with the Gentile world to store up food. In fact, he has the grain brought in from all over the land. Pharaoh had put him, given him the charge over the Gentiles, not of all of his province, of all his region. It's pretty much the same way it was with Yeshua, if you think about it. He sits at the right hand of God and given complete authority. In all the time while Joseph is working in the seven years of plenty, much like uh, we see in the book of Revelation when it talks about the seven churches of Asia Minor. In the seven churches of Asia Minor, we can find types of those churches down through the last 2,000 years. So does it really represent seven different church ages, or is it the spirit of the churches down through the ages? I kind of take it more in that respect there because we can clearly see those churches represented here today, just as it was back 2,000 years ago when John wrote about them, they were all represented at that very time and place then. We can see down through the last 2,000 years that same type of spirit has followed the people all the way through. Now, in this case here, the seven years of plenty, this is where God has been blessing the Gentile people. Because why? They accepted Yeshua. And that water of life, the very Eitz Chaim that had been rejected by Adam and Eve because of sin, got poured out upon the Gentiles. And of course, we know that the Jewish people first accepted it. It was the remnant of Israel that actually was blessed by this originally. But as a whole, Israel would turn it down. And the only reason that would be that way is because God knew that he had to fulfill his word to Abraham where he would be the father of many nations. So there were many other nations that still had to come in. And this is one of the reasons why Yeshua, another one of his prophecies, where he says, I have other sheep besides this fold, and I must also go after them. This is what his disciples were commanded, is to go and find the lost sheep and to bring them in. And so the Spirit of God has been poured out and gone down through all the Gentile world. And the Gentiles, this entire time, had been storing up the food. In fact, even the Gentiles during the famine, the Egyptians and the other nations, they will actually feed on that very gathering, that very harvest of those first seven years or the seven churches, in other words. But have we ever considered all this gathering has been because Joseph knew that his brethren would come home? That's the beauty of the story of Joseph. In fact, when his brothers first come down the first time, they don't even recognize him. They don't even realize that he is their brother. But Joseph recognizes them. That's just like Israel when she come back to her homeland. They do not recognize that it was Yahshua that made sure they come back to their homeland. And it's him that is fighting their battles, protecting them and keeping them safe. But they come back to the homeland. And of course, in this case here, his brothers had to come down to Egypt to buy grain. Joseph fills up their, their bags, sends them out. They don't know that their money is put back in the neck of the sack, but when they're on their way back, when they stop at the hotel, the Malone, the hotel, one of the brothers goes out to feed his ass, his, his donkey. When he opens the sack, 
his money's back in the sack. And it's no coincidence that his money was back in the sack there. And the reason being is because Yeshua had been rejected when he was in, the mother, in his mother's womb. And this is one of the reasons why we see this in the story of Joseph, that he is actually was rejected. Yeshua was rejected at a motel. He was forced to go to a stable. This is why his brothers find that money in their sack. Of course, they begin to be fearful and wonder, what in the world, what is this all about? And oddly enough, they remember what they did. Think about that. Later, though, we find in the story, though, they go back and uh, before they go back, uh, Joseph accused them of being spies. Now, this one, they, while they're there, actually, while they're there, he accuses them of being spies before they even leave. And another thing that happened in that event there is he requires that Simon be bound and kept prisoner until they brought back Benjamin. Now Simon in Hebrew, his name means he hears. And when Joseph had him bound, it shows that until Benjamin comes home, Israel's hearing would be bound. 